Recording's running. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Here we are for another Sunday. It is now Poetry Month officially here in the States and actually elsewhere. Yes, it is a cause for great celebration when we, any time we can gather to listen to and appreciate the power of poetry. You all have gathered here in wonderful numbers to appreciate the publication of just an, well, it is, a, there's no other way to say it. It is a star studded anthology packed to the gills with poems about one of the most iconic of the iconic movie stars in history, Marilyn Monroe. Today on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry, I'm so absolutely pleased to be able to welcome our all-star cast of poets along with, along with the editors of I Wanna Be Loved by You, poems about Marilyn Monroe, Susanna Case and Margot Taft Stever. Uh, just a little bit before I turn over to our illustrious editors as well. Uh, I'll be your host for today, Sandy Anone. And I also have the pleasure to be a reader this afternoon. And I could not be more happy than to bring forth for you this book that, as I said, uh, uh, celebrates and contextualizes and uh, makes prismatic uh, the life of Marilyn Monroe. I'm, as I said, I'm going to turn over to Margot and, Su and Susanna Case to talk about the anthology before we get into the poems. And I'll also have them mention and talk about the fact that uh, we are, we have, uh, this is also uh, an anthology, the proceeds of which are going to support the organization RAIN. And I will uh, let them talk a little bit about that. We'll be putting in the chat for you um, a link so that you, uh, if you care to uh, support the organization on your own and or learn more about the organization, you'll be able to do that. And I want to also let you know that one of our fabulous audience members today will be uh, receiving a copy gratis of uh, Milk and Cane, um, Milk and Cane, Milk and Cake Press. So we're very, very grateful to uh, Milk and Cake Press for uh, donating a copy of the anthology today. So let me just share a little bit about our two editors of this collection and move along to hear from them first. Well, Margot Taft Stever's latest of three full length poetry collections are Cracked Piano from Cave Carey Press 2019, which was shortlisted and received honorable mention for the 2021 Eric Hoffner Award Grand Prize. Her latest is The End of Horses from Broadstone Books. Her poems have appeared widely in so many places, including Verse Daily, Cincinnati Review, Salamander, Poet Lore, uh, the Academy of American Poets and Prairie Schooner, and she is currently an adjunct assistant professor in the bioethics department of the School of Medicine at Kate West, Case Western Reserve University. You also likely know Stever because she teaches poetry workshops at the Children's Village, a residential school for at-risk children and adolescents, 
and is the co is the a founder of the Hudson Valley Writers Center. And if you have not attended any of their events, I, I highly, highly recommend you spend some time in the Hudson Valley with this incredible, um, incredible center for poetry and the arts. She's also, as if all of these things were not enough, the found, uh, founding and current co-editor of Slappering Hall Press, which we were so happy to um, help celebrate uh, their 30th anniversary with a reading last year. Well, joining her is Susanna H. Cases, the author of eight books of poetry, most recently, The Damage Done from Broadstone Books. You've heard her read here from Dead Shark on the End Train from Broadstone Books in 2020, which won a Pinnacle Book Award for Best Poetry Book and a New York City Big Book Award Distinguished Favorite and was a finalist for also the Eric Hoffer Book Award. She's a busy, busy writer and is the author of five chapbooks. And her first collection, which I hope many of you, if not all of you are familiar with, The Scottish Cafe from Slappering Hall Press was re-released in a dual language, English, Polish version. She's been published vastly in places like Calyx and the Cortland Review, Portland Review, Rattle, Rhino and Upstreet, and she recently retired as professor from the New York Institute of Technology in New York City. She taught there for 38 years. Congratulations on that career and is a co-editor of Slappering Hall Press. Well, would you two join us and share with us some about the making of the anthology and uh, welcome and I can't wait to hear all the poems. Thank you so much for that, those wonderful introductions. And um, also welcome everybody, every one of these, we've had a number of readings so far and each one of them has been so fantastic. And there are so many different poets represented and as Sandy said, they're such great poets and it's so wonderful to have some new voices at this reading that we haven't heard yet, Denise Duhamel, Sebastian Matthews, but anyway, it's just been an, an amazing experience for Susanna and I to put the anthology together and find out how many amazing poets, poems have been written on, Mar on Marilyn Monroe. Um, <clears throat> also, I wanted to thank Sandy for putting together this great reading series and Don Krieger for all the work that he, technical work he does, which is really amazing. And he's helped so many organizations and is also, both of them are wonderful poets. Um, I was just going to start off by reading a poem by Marilyn Monroe, which she, <clears throat> which was included in the book Fragments, published posthumously in 2010, and we just chose one. It was kind of an arbitrary almost decision because they were all good, but I think we, our view is, I believe, at least my view is that that she has a lot of had a lot of potential, but maybe didn't ever get the encouragement she might have been able to get as a poet. Anyway, here's her poem that's titled, I Left My Home of Green Rough Wood. A blue velvet couch I dream till now, a shiny dark bush just left of the door. Down the walk, clickety clack as my doll in her carriage went over the crack. We'll go far away. The meadows are huge, the earth will be hard on my back. The grass touched the blue and still white clouds changing from an old man shapes to a smiling dog with, flying e with ears flying. Look, the meadows are reaching, they're touching the sky. We left our outlines against, against the crushed grass. It will die sooner because we were there. Will something else have grown? Don't cry, my doll, don't cry. I hold you and rock you to sleep, hush, hush. I was only pretending now, I'm not your mother who died. I shall feed you from the shiny dark bush just left of the door. Thank you. So um, Margo and I were both reading at the same 
online reading event. And by coincidence, we both read a poem about Marilyn Monroe. And so we were talking after and from that conversation and that sort of serendipity choice of poems to read, the anthology um, was born. So um, I'm going to, I'm a little um, uh, uncentered because not only is there a troll in the, uh, in the chat, which is now disabled saying, fuck you, Susanna, but I'm getting uh, lots of emails from some of our readers who are, are unfortunately not still able to get in, but we'll work with what we have. Zoom is not behaving today. So I'm going to uh, read the poem of one of the contributors to the anthology who isn't here. And this is Judy Grand's poem, I Have Come to Claim Marilyn Monroe's Body. I have come to claim Marilyn Monroe's body for the sake of my own. Dig it up, hand it over, cram it into this paper sack. Hubba, 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 look at those luscious long brown bones, that wide and crusty <laughs> pelvis. Ha. Ha, oh, she wanted so much to be serious, but she never stops smiling now. Has she lost her mind? Marilyn, be serious. They're taking your picture and they're taking the pictures of eight young women in New York City who murdered themselves for being pretty by the same method as you. The very next day after you, I have claimed their bodies too. They smile up out of my paper sack like brainless Cinderella's. The reporters are furious. They're asking me questions. What right does a woman have to Marilyn Monroe's body? And what am I doing for lunch? They think I mean to eat you. Their teeth are lurid and they want to pose me leaning on the shovel nude. Don't squint, but when the reporters come too close, I beat him. When one, sorry, when one of the reporters comes too close, I beat him. Bust his camera with your long, smooth thigh, and with your lovely knuckle bone, I break his eye. Long ago, you wanted to write poems. Be serious, Marilyn. I am going to take you in this paper sack around the world and write on it the poems of Marilyn Monroe, dedicated to all princes, the male poets who were so sorry to see you go before they had a crack at you. They wept for you and also they wanted to stuff you while you still had a little meat left in useful places, but they were too slow. Now I shall take them my paper sack and we shall act out a poem together. How would you like to see Marilyn Monroe in action, smiling and without her clothes? We shall wait long enough to see them make familiar faces and then I shall beat them with your skull. Hubba, 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 hubba. Marilyn, be serious. Today, I have come to claim your body for my own. Thank you. Thank you both. And uh, nothing will deter us from celebrating the work of the poems of the collection, I Want to Be Loved by You, poems about Marilyn Monroe, a little bit for you all. If you're not familiar with the poetry of Judy Gron, I, I had I, I've had the, the the pleasure to hear her read over her career a number of times, and want to highlight uh, she's her work has been so significant um, in poetry, including her collections Edward the Dyke and other poems. She who, and a woman is talking to death. And if you're, not, if you're not familiar with those individual collections, they were reissued as The Work of a Common Woman, The Collected Poetry of Judy Gron, 1964 to 1977. And her work has received numerous awards, including Lambda Literary Award. And her most recent collection is hanging on our own bones from Arctoid books. I should also share that she's had a lifetime achievement award as well from in lesbian letters from Triangle Publishers. It's a real pleasure to start off the reading with that poem. And we will move next to 
Sebastian Matthews, who is the author of a memoir and two books, including most recent, two books of poetry, including most recent work, The Beginner's Guide to a Head-on Collision and Beyond Repair, Living in a Fractured State, which was a finalist for the 2021 Eric Hoffer Award. And both books are published by Red Hen Press. Would you please welcome Sebastian Matthews? He was one of the people having trouble getting in, so I don't know if he got in or not. Yeah, I see him on the list. Okay. So there's Sebastian. Hey, how's it going? Uh, can you hear me? Great. Okay. Um, thank you, Susanna. Sorry for all the trouble. And uh, Margo, it's a great anthology. It's an honor to be a part of it, to be reading with these poets today. And thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us in this Zoom room. When I first heard about this uh, anthology, I thought, well, I don't really have anything to, to send. Um, you know, I, then I began thinking about Marilyn Monroe, and I thought of Some Like It Hot. And I just didn't know if I had a connection to it enough to write. And then I remembered a story about Marilyn Monroe. Uh, I was a friend of and a uh, help for Elis uh, Ella Fitzgerald. And um, I looked it up and I looked up the story from a couple different angles. And it, it always seemed a little apocryphal for me and a little um, white savior Hollywood kind of um, the, the pretty white lady comes and swoops in and helps this woman. Um, and I thought, well, maybe I need to subvert that story. Um, and, and that's what this is. The night Ella escorted Marilyn through the front door of the Macambo. You heard it wrong. It was Ella ensconced in the front row all week, not Marilyn. And Ella, who was joined not by Sinatra and Garland, but by Robeson and Horn. And Ella, who had her white friends back, allying her, allying for a woman not deemed attractive enough to perform. And it wasn't LA, but Kansas City or Detroit. And here comes the inimitable Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith, and the young Alberta Hunter, drinks all around the foretop. And Marilyn never stopped being Billie Jean and wasn't strumming that damn ukulele or fake whispering. Hair in a brown bob, shirt and collar, stomping boots, but belting out a country blues of her ghosted past. While we're at it, whites only signs never existed. King's beloved community was baked into the Constitution, and John Lewis never had to walk onto that bridge. The Billy Clubs flying and sped up reverse back into their holsters. Cops morphing into regular people like us, all sizes and hues and proclivities, heading out to a field full of banquet tables piled high with steaming food. Kegs cooling under trees whose limbs have never been asked to bear black bodies, and a band playing some down-home dirty blues and everyone up dancing and shouting. Now, wouldn't that be something? Thank you. I can't hear Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, Sebastian. And our next reader, our next reader will be Barbara Goldberg, who has authored eight prize-winning books of poetry, including The Royal Baker's Daughter, which won the Felix Pollock Poetry Prize. She's been the recipient of two fellowships from the National Endowment of the Arts. And her most recent collection is Breaking and Entering, New and Selected Poems. Welcome, Barbara. Thanks for being with us today. I think you need to unmute. <laughs> How's that? Good. There you go. There you go. Okay. Well, Sebastian said he didn't know if he had any entry into, <laughs> into Maryland, and I can tell you I didn't at all. Um, you have to understand I was very short. I had very black hair then. 
So I had no connection with her because don't we always love ourselves? Marilyn, had it been me, I never would have chosen her. Too blonde, too white, too drop dead gorgeous. Not to mention her voice, breathy and hesitant. I guess some men like that. Luckily for Marilyn, I'm not a man. Now take Audrey Hepburn, petite, spiked bangs, French twist, her taste for someone I could grow into. So many girls like to make themselves stupid or lose on purpose. Like that girl in college, also blonde, also stacked. She could spin a thousand angels on the head of a pin, but at parties, she drink too much and act dumb. The boy, she said, ate it up. I wouldn't even want a guy like that who wouldn't know how to spar or crack a joke who'd simply ache to dive head first into her decolletage and sleep in the pillowy softness of her flesh. I preferred those who hoarded secrets, little treasures buried like truffles deep in the underbelly of the earth. Thank you. I'm loving hearing all these different, you know, these different iterations of, of, of how we interpret Marilyn, of course. And that's the, I mean, that's the allure of the project. That's the allure of the anthology, isn't it? The, the uh, you know, there's really no other word for it. Uh, I, I, I think of this anthology as its own kind of mirror ball, you know, casting all its, you know, casting its light in all these different facets. Uh, and each one of those squares on that mirror ball, a poem. Well, our next, our next poet that we will hear from will be Tina Kane. And there's, and there's Tina right there. Fabulous. Can you hear me? Can, Can you hear me, hear me right? perfectly, Tina? Okay. Thank you. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you, Absolutely. Suzanne. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about, I'm going to share a little bit about you if you oh, don't you mind. Are. Okay. Okay, yeah, no worries. <laughs> we are, but make no mistake, we're very eager to hear your poem, of course. Uh, Tina King currently serves as the Poet Laureate of Rhode Island, and all of you here in Cultivating Voices Live Poetry know that we have a dear, dear place in our hearts for Poet Laureates who are our members and um, who have joined us on the program over the past two years. Oh, oh, okay. Got that situation taken care of. There, uh, where's whew, the trickster energy is out there today, my friends? Obviously. Wow. I would have thought it was April Fool's Day if I didn't know better. Anyway, let me start again. Tina. Kane is the illustrious, illustrious poet laureate of the wonderful state of Rhode Island. I know it well because I'm from Connecticut. And uh, if you've never been, so many incredible places there, where she is the founder and director of the Writers in the Schools Rhode Island program. Look for her co produced podcast with Atticus Allen, Poetry Dose. And here are some of her collections that you also want to be looking out for. The Fifth Thought, Dear Elena, Letters for Elena Ferrante, and Poems with Art by Esther Sol Solons, Once More with Feeling and a Body of Work. And I should also share with you that Tina is a 2020 Poet Laureate Fellow with the Academy of American Poets. It's such a pleasure to have you with us today, Tina. I can't wait Thank to hear you. your poem. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Perfectly. 
Great. Um, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be part of this anthology. And what's amazing, and I think I might have, I might have written this in an email, um, but the the morning that I got the invitation to submit, I had been working on a poem, which is this poem, and I have the book fragments, and uh, I look at it occasionally. Um, mostly because I really like the notes that Marilyn Monroe wrote on hotel um, hotel paper, hotel stationery, uh, you know, just that ephemera. But um, but I actually, as a kid, developed uh, this affinity for Marilyn Monroe bizarrely because you know we have nothing in common except that, and it's actually in my book Body of Work in the poem. Oh my God! Oh, oh man! Oh, man. Oh, man. Can you hear me? Okay. I talk about um, the fact that as a uh, girl, when I was about 11 or 12, I had a photograph of Marilyn Monroe above my bureau from a book my mother had gotten me. And it's a photograph of her wearing reading glasses, sitting by a window reading a book. And that was the Marilyn Monroe that I was really interested in <laughs> because she liked books. And in, in my other poem, it's like, she liked books like me and neither of us spoke Chinese. So I think there was something kind of some kind of sadness about Marilyn Monroe that I somehow related to or connected to, and that dichotomy that I understood just by the photograph of her reading a book. So anyway, the morning that I got the invitation, about two hours earlier, I had found a quote, I think in fragments by Monroe, um, "Fear is stupid, so are regrets," and I thought, oh well, that's the epigraph to this poem, YOLO, and that became the connection um, to Monroe. Um, and this, this poem YOLO, which is an acronym for you only live once, it's that kind of like cheesy thing that you see at airports on mugs and stuff. Um, so, um, but this poem will appear in, I have a book coming out in May called Year of the Murder Hornet. And this poem is in there. YOLO, fear is stupid, so are regrets, Marilyn Monroe, one. Catherine says, a tree out loud in your head matters. I know exactly what she means. I've been listening to leaves for a while now. Recently, I read that Sylvia Plath got an avocado for her 14th birthday. It was her favorite gift, though even then she feared she was growing decrepit at the same age my daughter is today. Two. I think about the way my kids laughed when I told them that Laura Ingalls Wilder and her sisters were thrilled to find oranges in their stockings at Christmas time. A different world, I explained, all rarity having been expunged from this one. The invisible, obvious being, what if dreams don't come true? Three, a unit of meaning, me and you, also matters meaning. Breathing into breathing, a lifetime matters me. On paper, acting as if this be that be named my truth until it be an avocado, easily bruised as girls, but only some of them. Four, Catherine also says patterns, that poems are like math or science. It's true when I'm in them, invisible natures align and I sense systems. As each morning, some American man masturbating to Instagram goes on living his best life, straight up with a fresh cup of YOLO. And the paper saying it's a free country is one way his body summons management of a place that makes him feel alone. If we carried poems instead of phones, what would come of it? Five, my kids insist the male version of Karen should be Brad making me wonder at whose pleasure he would serve, as if everyone deserves a service creature like that peacock in business class, taking up three seats, its iridescent wings clipped and blocking the aisle. Six, this morning I told my youngest son, yes, Google can be wrong because people made Google and people can be boring is what he's thinking. So instead he tells me that chicken nug life is his friend's handle on Fortnite. Friend, I ask using air quotes, 
Yes, he smiles, air quoting me back. We're laughing so hard about Nug, I am doubled over, like the woman in the drawing Terence sent, the day of the coup attempt. A warding off, he called it. Prescient, I said. It's pretty funny, my son gasps. Yes, honey, I cry. You have no idea just how funny it is. Thank you. Oh, I definitely feel like I'm not the Oscars. <laughs> I definitely feel like... Thank you so much, Tina. Wow, yeah, the poem. I, I, yeah, it's such a great idea to have an anthology reading. I, I, uh, we really should do more of them on Cultivating Voices because they are, uh, first of all, they 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 are they're 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 quintessential to, you know, how we deliver poetry. But the idea also of creating a community through through poetry of of poets that might not be in dialogue with each other otherwise suddenly get to be in conversation, and that's what I'm really enjoying. Uh, as we are hearing the poems from today's uh, featured anthology, Milk and Cake Press, with editors Susanna H. Case and Margot Taft-Stever, I Want to Be Loved by You, poems about Marilyn Monroe. In the chat, you'll also notice there's a link to purchase the anthology if you are enjoying just this slice of the anthology, you will want to certainly purchase the entire cake. The entire cake. That is the anthology. And you'll see the link to that in the chat, as well as a link to uh, the organization RAIN, which is an organization um, to encourage education and advocacy to eradicate um, domestic violence and support um, to support people who are in the throes of that very difficult situation in their lives. So please do educate yourself about rain and if you care to make an uh, if you care to make a donation as as the as the proceeds for this anthology uh, will be going to the rain organization feel free to do so the link is there for you well our next reader from this as i said star-studded anthology is uh, is the wonderful sally Blumas Dunn, and Sally has been with us before reading from her most recent collection uh, earlier when we were, uh, when we, when we had, uh, uh, when we had some readings with Slappering Hall Press uh, earlier uh, in last year, and it's such a great pleasure to have Sally return to share a poem from the anthology, Sally teaches modern poetry at Manhattanville College and also is connected with the Palm Beach Poetry Festival. She's had quite a career where she's been a finalist for the Nimrod Hardman Pablo Neruda Prize and two of her books, Talking Underwater and Second Skin were published by Wind Publications. As I mentioned, her full length collection, her third, Echo Location, was published by Plume Editions, Mad Hat Press, and it was long listed for the Julie Soup Award and a runner up for both the Eric Hoffer Prize and Poetry by the Sea Prize. Thanks for so much for being with us, Sally, and take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sandy. I remember reading in your series very well. Um, I wanted to hold up this anthology. It's just the de Kooning is so, so beautiful. 
And I have such admiration for Margo and Susanna for putting this together. I can't imagine the amount of work. And I love the mix and what Sandy was saying about a community accruing around an anthology, I really feel that. So here's my rather short poem. It's called Marilyn. I got a schnauzer mix this morning at the pound. A female, one year old, I will spay her per the rules. She stands eagerly on two hind legs, front paws resting on my shins to reach up for a nuzzle. Her white fur reminds me of Marilyn's white dress. In that famous shot, the wind, her panties, the dress lifting around her legs like butterfly wings open in flight. I will name my schnauzer Marilyn, as though that could erase the deadly hypodermic mix of torment and desire. Each time I hear the patter scratch against the wooden floor, and that little dog runs to me, unconfused about what she wants. Thanks. Well, I'm just getting so swept up in all the poems. I have to remember that I have to keep the program moving along. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. Thank you. And I look forward to the next time you join us, of course. Well, our next reader is Hoyt Rogers. And, and Hoyt is an, in, an incredible translator from numerous, in numerous languages, French, translates from the French, the German, the Italian, and Spanish, and has had numerous, numerous poets that he's trans that Hoyt's translated over the years, including uh, Jorge Luis Borges, um, Yves Bonafoy, Andre de Boucher, and along with Paul Auster, Richard Howard, Lincoln Kirstein, and Alistair Reed has collaborated on books for a number of houses, including Ferrer Strauss, Knopf Random House, Athenium, Yale Margellos, Viking Penguin, and many, many others. A forthcoming novel, as if the translations and the work with these presses is not enough, is called Sailing to Noon, which was co-authored by, by uh, with uh, Artismia, Artemisia Vento, and it's forthcoming from Insula Press. Would you please welcome to share a poem about Marilyn Hoyt Rogers? Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Um, I just need to pull the poem up. So glad to be with you all today. In fact, I just had lunch with Fran Baez, the author of this poem, uh, here on the north coast of Dominican Republic, where we all live. So, straight from the tropics, here we go with the Marilyn Monroe of Santo Domingo. I'm the Marilyn Monroe of Santo Domingo. I'm six feet four, two inches more when I wear high heels, have a beauty spot on my butt. I date poets from the eighties. I date handymen, security guards, models, engineers, visual artists, weightlifters, lawyers, white boys, paper pushers, heavy hitters, car valets. I'm a regular at the bingo parlor, the woman who puts leaves of grass in her pocketbook and gets lost in space. The woman who drinks coffee at bus, bus stops, the man eater, the pythoness, the mega poet, the woman who cries when the movie ends and nobody gives her a hug. I'm a menstruating monster, the woman who sits in the dance joints and drinks, who ties one on and makes the whores look disgusted and burns their miniskirts with cigarettes when they go by. The woman who wanted to kidnap Anthony Rios. Sorry about that. 
uh, the woman, the woman who injects hormones in her legs. Sorry about that. Why, I wonder why WhatsApp was ever invented. I'm so sorry about this, everyone. All right, here we go. I'm a regular at the bingo parlor, the woman who puts leaves of grass in her pocketbook and gets lost in space, the woman who drinks coffee at bus stops, the man eater, the pythoness, the mega poet, the woman who cries when the movie ends and nobody gives her a hug. I'm a menstruating monster, the woman who sits in the dance joints and drinks, who ties one on and makes the whores look disgusted and burns their miniskirts with cigarettes when they go by. The woman who wanted to kidnap Anthony Rios. The woman who injects hormones in her legs. I'm La Chicholina. I'm Theresius. The woman who rides buck naked. That big boned woman who's multiplied by the motel mirrors when they do her doggy style. The woman who sits in the back pew of the church with the black eye. Miss Boca Chica. 1994, that woman who smokes on the ocean boulevard watching the ships with their lights turned off. The second semester nursing student, the white girl who drives ambulances, city buses, passenger vans, trailer trucks. I'm the Marilyn Monroe of Santo Domingo. I'm the Marilyn Monroe of Santo Domingo. No, no, that thing was still there. I hadn't chopped it off. I didn't have the money to do it with. So one day I thought, I'm gonna do readings to raise the money and have that operation. I called on my poet friends on the telephone. I remember how they passed the basket around like they do at masses. And there I was standing on the stage, the pure tea Marilyn Monroe of Santo Domingo, reading my verses and grateful for the applause. Thank you, poet friends. Thank you, Mr. Minister of Culture. Thank you very much. A mob follows me with rocks. They stone me in the Maya. They stone me at the car wash in San Isidro. The ones in Los Mameyes, the Charles and Via Maya, behind Quisqueya Stadium. They beat me, humiliate me, shout at me. They give me a thrashing. They pile on top of me one by one. I've lost myself. I'm no longer here. I repeat, I've lost myself. I don't know how to find myself. I go to the four cardinal points looking for myself in a procession with all the women I've been and those that I'll be and those that I cannot be. I sleep in hospital beds, guest houses, motels, parks. I take showers, lots of showers. The dye runs down my face and down my makeup. I feel like I'm coming apart and pieces of me keep falling one by one taking the shower water with them. The water keeps falling and taking me with it down to the drain. Here I am on the rear of a 70 motorbike, dancing with three men on a patio, walking on a busted high heel, massaging Italian tourists, sitting on my suitcase at an intersection, trying to hitch a ride. Two guys in a Toyota pull up. The one who's driving asked me, Hey, white girl, where are you going, babe? And I answer, going to LA, all the way down to LA. You know, Los Alcarrizos. They lead me 13 kilometers further on. I walk to the other side of the road and they hang around looking at me till on this side, a leche rica milk truck stops and I climb in. Here, I open a parenthesis to advise you, you need to get an AIDS test. I do one every year. They give it to you in a week at most, 180 pesos near the WAST. I go with divorced guys, 
widowers, atheists, priests, art critics, psychoanalysts, ex-suicides, salsa lovers, scooter drivers, Haitians, Protestant pastors, clowns, the terminally ill, schizos, broke boxers. I wake up in Puerto Plata. I have visions in Aswa. I see the Pope dancing salsa. I see igloos in Haina and Tres Brazos, Eskimos in mom and pop stores, penguins in Mao, St. Augustine with eyelashes like chatty teen, UFOs abducting senators and congressmen. There's a country in the world placed in the sun's very path. There's in the world a very country placed in the sun's path. There's the sun's very path placed in a country in the world. There's the sun's path in the very world placed in a country. I traveled to New York with a fake passport. Marilyn Monroe walking down Fifth Avenue again. Marilyn Monroe with a three-day beard. I have breakfast at Tiffany's. I drink champagne in limousines. I run for my life in Corona. I play the accordion at a corner. I fight in Soho. I cry in front of the Hudson. I give a reading at the New York Weekend Cafe. Rhymesters, poets, and rappers toss me sprays of flowers. I sign autographs. I spread kisses all around. Suddenly, the doors bust wide open. The INS guys put me in handcuffs. They push me, and meanwhile, the audience boos them and throws bottles. Shots are heard. They deport me. I'm the Marilyn Monroe of Santo Domingo. I get a wax job all over, powder myself, do my makeup, put on a fur coat, ready for my next reading. I'm the Domingo. I'm the Marilyn Monroe of Santo Domingo. What's a girl to do? <laughs> Thank you. And why shouldn't the Marilyn Monroe of Santo Domingo be with us today? Thank you so, so much. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about the interruption, <laughs> but it might have happened to her. You never as, it's, as I said, the trickster energy seems to be with us today. <clears throat> all is well. All is well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Our next reader is Suzanne Sigafus. And I'm so thrilled to share that her debut full length collection of poems is this swarm of light from iBeam books. It is so fun always and near and dear to my heart to welcome folks who have you know, their debuts uh, out and about in the world. Suzanne also has a chapbook, Held in the Weave, which was published by Finishing Line Press and has served as poetry editor for Voice Catcher Journal. What a great honor to have you with us today, Suzanne. Thanks. Thank you, Sandy. Oh, I am so... Um extra charged about being part of this anthology. Um, what a wonderful reading we've had so far. Thank you to all the readers and all of you to come. Um, I am a late blooming poet. So um, <laughs> thanks, Sandy. Um, yeah, my, my new, my new com uh, collection came out in 2020. So very excited about that. And this poem, oh my goodness. Um, the poem I'm gonna read for you is kind of brief, but um, I will tell you about how I connected with uh, Marilyn. Now I wrote this in 1997 um, and it happened to be the first poem ever published by me. So, you know, full circle moment and I'm so excited to have a new home with all of you for this poem. Um, when Marilyn, so the title is Marilyn Shooting the Misfits. And that, poem, uh, that film was a very difficult film. It was hard for me to watch and then hard for me to read about the fact that when she was on that set out in the desert, 
uh, her marriage was really rocky with uh, Arthur Miller. Um, it, it was, she was far from Hollywood and from her comforts. And um, I, I connected with her because, oh, and I saw, her, I saw a, a really poignant photograph of her sitting in a pickup truck. I bet some of you have seen it. Um, straw hat, sort of looking downcast and all I could feel was her exhaustion. Um, I too was having, uh, I was doing a, a pretty difficult job at that time. And I too was in a marriage that was falling apart. So I just merged with her momentarily as those things happen. And um, I was able to write this poem. So um, honored to present it to you today. Marilyn shooting the misfits. My requirements for the trailer, check for radium, shaved ice daily, a radio so I don't miss hit the jackpot. Here I am in fucking Nevada watching Monty and Clark's mascara melt. I could never be a boy. State of being, USA. I know what Nevada means. Nothing, sorrow, the opposite of forever. I can never be a boy, but I can run full speed toward nothing. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, that, that repetition. I could never be a boy. I could never be a boy. So interesting. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, Marilyn Monroe as an iconic figure brings, brings up so many questions about gender, um, uh, particularly uh, uh, in, well, I'll let the gender studies folks analyze all of that. But just to say, from my perspective, brings up many, many issues around gender. And I'm also thinking about um, another film of hers, Some Like It Hot, uh, where there is uh, much ado about gender in that film. If you haven't ever seen that film, um, uh, I, 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 I highly encourage it. Uh, so I'll move along. Uh, this isn't a discography of Marilyn's uh, film. Uh, we could go on, I could go on all about it, but instead I'm gonna take us to our next reader. Uh, and again, so happy to welcome back to, to uh, Cultivating Voices live poetry, Denise Duhamel, who's read from the very collection that is her most recent book of poetry, Second Story, was in a new book showcase with us and also has, has read from another anthology reading that we did earlier uh, in the series. Denise's other titles include Scald, Blowout, Kaching, Two and Two, Queen for a Day, Selected and New Poems, the Star Spangled Banner and Kinky. Denise is the consummate collaborator and has worked with Maureen Seaton on four collections of poetry as well as with Julie Marie Wade. Um, and I'll just mention the Unrhymables collaborations in prose if you're not familiar with that collection. I actually have it right here behind my, behind me here. Um, Denise has been a recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim and the National Endowment for the Arts and teaches in the MFA program at Florida International University in Miami. And all I can say is I can't wait. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. Thank you so much for organizing this reading. And thank you, Margot and Susanna, for including me. Um, so 
my poem also has quotes from Marilyn Monroe's poetry in it. So I'm gonna to try to do like air quotes just so you can tell, you'll probably be able to tell just so you can tell the difference. Um, and my connection to Marilyn was like her very uh, traumatic childhood. And this is called Duffel Pantoum. Marilyn's mother stuffed her in a duffel bag when she was just three. Gladys tried to kidnap her own daughter from her foster mother who saw the wiggling, who understood the awful darkness of a terrified toddler. Gladys tried to kidnap Marilyn again and again. Marilyn who grew up to wiggle, to understand the darkness of men. She cooed like a child, talked baby talk. Marilyn again and again was a who's who of sex pots. No one caring about her torment, especially men. She cooed, talked baby talk, dyed her brown tresses blonde to become the princess of sex pots. No one cared about her torment, not JFK or Bobby, not Joe DiMaggio. She dyed her brown tresses blonde, became a model after Ronald Reagan spotted her. Famous men, JFK, Barbie, Arthur Miller, DiMaggio were each cruel to Marilyn in their own ways. After Ronald Reagan spotted her, famous men and movie fans alike were drawn to the bombshell. We were all cruel to Marilyn in our own ways. Her glittering surface convinced us she was dumb, but even women were drawn to the bombshell who wrote bad poetry, hair lying like snakes. Her superficial verse convinced me she was dumb with cliched lines like, Sometimes good things fall apart. But then I found an astonishing poem, Sand Snakes. When the hourglass takes off its dress, sand, good lines, right? Loosens and spreads. They always said, I wrote bad poetry. I was terrible in bed. Of course, she was the hourglass in the dress, afraid of tight spaces, gowns and their zippers. She wrote a good poem. She was terrible in bed. She had no daughter, never became a mother, too afraid of tight spaces, all kinds of zippers, her own mother stuffing her in that duffel bag. Thank you for listening, thanks. Yes, there's nothing like a pantoum. Mm. <laughs> Thank you so much, Denise. I, I just, I feel like I'm in the theater and I'm just, I'm just watching and listening to the poems. It's beautiful. Our next reader will be Lynn McGee. And Lynn's poetry collections include tracks from Broadstone, Broadstone Books, Sober Cooking, from Sputin DeVille and two award-winning chapbooks, Heirloom Bulldog from Bright Hill Press and Bonanza from Slappering Hall Press, two fabulous presses that uh, we dearly, dearly love here at Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Lynn also has a children's book, Starting Over in Sunset Park, which she co-wrote with Jose Palouz and was published by Tilbury House Publishers and distributed by Norton. Uh, uh, my heart warms me to welcome you to read your contribution, Lynn. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Sandy and uh, Susanna and Margo for for Susanna and Margo for editing this amazing anthology. I can't wait to get my hands on it. I've been hearing the poems now at several readings. I really wanna see them on the page. Um, I, I was aware of Marilyn Monroe when I was a, a little girl, very small little girl. I was aware of movie stars and I was aware of the enactment of um, gender expectations between women and men. I was aware of it. And I didn't see her as stupid. I really saw her as a woman who was able to deflect um, the cruelty of men. And she did it in clever and funny and surprising ways. I saw her as a woman taking power, even as a small child. Okay. 
cocktail dress uh, commands millions at auction. I'm talking in this poem about the dress she wore when she sang happy birthday to um, President um, John F. Kennedy in Madison Square Garden a few months before she uh, was found dead uh, in Los Angeles. Her dress taunted the camera with refracted light, but it wasn't the galaxy of crystals and rhinestones that garnered five million at auction. It was the gauzy beige fabric between them, meant to be read as skin. It was a costume designer's narrow fingers pulling a needle that closed a seam and grazed the womanly belly, the undercurve of breasts as she stood very still, shrink wrapped in silk. It was her tiny mincing steps to the mic, quick, apologetic, late and the white ermine coat dropped like canvas from a billboard, the tantalizing reveal. It was thousands cheering, leering in Madison Square Garden. It was the grainy news photo a few months later, her body rolled out on a stretcher and the dress compelled to live forever, shimmering on a mannequin, headless, no arms or feet, propped in a plexiglass case in Ripley's Auditorium, St. Augustine, Florida, a city famous for its masonry fort, a military prison for the Seminole and Apache who made art on the brick walls of their cells, leaving a record of what really happened. Thank you. Oh, I wish we were here in the whole, oh gosh, I, I just, huh, what, a, what a poem. Um, I wish we were listening to like, I wish we could hear all the poems, all the poems, oh my gosh. I know it would be a marathon, but Marilyn is worthy of a marathon and um, grateful for these poems that are contributed from uh, the poets that we're getting to hear today from Uncultivating Voices, live poetry. We're listening to Poems from the anthology, I Want to Be Loved by You, Poems About Marilyn Monroe. We're here with editors Susanna Case and Margot Taft-Stever. The anthology is from Milk and Cake Press. Our next reader is Liz Marlowe. And again, I'm very happy to share that Liz Marlowe's debut chapbook they Became Stars, was the winner of the 2019 Slappering Hall Press chapbook competition. It's always wonderful to celebrate folks who are celebrating and bringing into the world, as I said, their debut collections. And now, would you please welcome Liz Marlowe. Thank you. Uh, thank you for including me in this beautiful anthology. And thank you also for including me in this reading with so many great people who I admire and have for a long time. Um, my poem is also about the misfits. Um, it's called Marilyn and Clark in the Desert. And um, it deals with a scene that really spoke to me. And um, I almost turned off the movie at this point because it's where there, um, the men are, are essentially capturing a horse and, um, and Marilyn appears, or her character has a mental breakdown at this point. Marilyn and Clark in the desert, everything colorless, but we can make out her daffodil hair contrasting his darkness, tan leather vest, lines, on his face deeper than hers. The mare's neck is her neck, rope tightening. She believes that kicking the air will loosen the lead, leash, noose, or wants to believe it. Healing begins with him listening to her rather than scorpions crawling the earth, pinching at life, snakes, bodies whisper in sand as they approach prey. 
rattles at the end. We need her oasis. We are the foal pawing at her neck as she lies, panting, broken. We are overheated, sun burnt, desperate for her to rise. Thank you. Wonderful, 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 Liz. Thank you. We are overheated. We're overheated from these poems about Marilyn Monroe and I'm overjoyed, of course, to be, be able to share them all with you along with all these amazing poets that we've been able to assemble here today to share from I Wanna Be Loved By You, poems about Marilyn Monroe. Our next poet, is Marion Brown. And another thing that I truly appreciate about this reading is that it also features um, poets that are that do such good that do such good works in their various poetry communities. And we have many constellations of those um, of those poets in in the various organizations. And Marion Brown really to me represents one of those folks. Uh, Marion's been a lifelong resident of New York State and living currently in Yonkers, and her chapbooks published by Finishing Line Press are Tasted and The Morning After Summer. She serves on the advisory committee of Slappering Hall Press and is the pro on the program committee of Hudson Valley Writers Center and the National Council of Grey Wolf Press. It's, again, my great pleasure to welcome Marion. Brown. Thank you so much, Sandy. And of course, thank you to Margot and Susanna for including me in this wonderful anthology. I actually wrote this poem um, to try to have it in the anthology. I think it's probably the first time I've ever done something like this. So I, I did some re I did I did some internet research and one thing that captured my attention and captured my imagination as well was that in the years when Marilyn was um, creating the persona that would become Marilyn Monroe, um, and a, one, important, one important facet was her whiteness. And, and it went with the time of of you know segregated America and they and it probably it probably helped her to establish her importance um, in the in as a celebrity and as a actress. So this poem is an abecedarian, blonde A to Z, available, bleach which is cheap disinfects, cheap denigrates character and class. DiMaggio the slugger. Easy means loose. FBI file, a wedding gift from number three. Gentlemen prefer blondes. Hot, some like it. Inventing herself pure white. Jokes provide cover. Knew when she was used. Loose looks easy. Mickey Mouse and Marilyn, born Norma Jean Mortensen in LA, owning Marilyn. Painful menses, pregnancies miscarry. Queer? Reviewers note a knack for comedy. Straightened hair. Tragedy penciled in. Underpaid, undressed, unknown father. Vodka just as colorless. Woman defanged, pale girl in a white dress. X marks the censor's itch. Yellow, one shade, Harlow platinum, another. Zones that are erotic, choose. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marion, for the for the, uh, the courage to write to the anthology. I mean, I, I love that you shared that with us and it's, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? 
And also the fact that we get to hear um, what's so rich about, I think the anthology itself is that it, it represents um, the diversity of, of the ways that Marilyn not only is interpreted through popular culture, gender studies and, and, and the various ways that um, also she's been portrayed, but we're also getting to see the diversity of the ways that the poets are able to represent through the different forms that we've heard already, the pantoum, the abecedarian, and, um, and, and, and all these different takes. It's, it's, been, it's, it's been wonderful and let us move on to our next poet for more from I Wanna Be Loved By You, poems about Marilyn Monroe. Well, our next poet is Valerie Frost and Valerie has been nominated for Sonder Press's 2020 Best Small Fictions Anthology. And we're very thrilled to uh, have her with us. She's joining us today from Central Kentucky with her twins and it's terrific to have you and your contribution on the program today. Thank you so much, Valerie. Hi everyone. And I would also like to echo, thank you to Susanna and Margo for including me in this anthology. I'd also like to thank Cultivating Voices for having me here today. Um, and Lynn set this up a little bit, but I, I'll go back and repeat just some context for my piece. Um, I wrote a letter, so it's dated May 29th, 1962, which is JFK's actual birthday. She sang happy birthday, Mr. President, 10 days prior. So it was before his actual birthday um, in Madison Square Gardens in New York City. Um, and that was 1962 is also the year, um, a couple of months after um, this letter was, was written. <laughs> a couple of months after his birthday that year was when uh, Marilyn was, was found um, dead in her apartment. And the year after this, 1963, is when JFK was assassinated. Just some historical context for my piece here. And it is newly discovered long lost letter from Marilyn to JFK, May 29th, 1962. Dear John, they laugh at the idea of us. What does a dumb blonde know about politics? Well, I know what it's like in Hollywood. They want you to be somebody, they're somebody. Nobody's perfect. Well, they sure give you a hard time about being human. You and I, John, there are two sides to us, yet we're both one and the same. Joe, he's just like them, telling me what I can and can't do. I can't make Hollywood happy. Joe, Arthur, I can't make them happy either. John, I'm scared. It's been so dark lately and the pain, the pain, it just won't go away. It all hurts. And I fear the shadows will swallow me whole, just like that beaded cage of a dress. Except this I can't get out of, John. I, I can't breathe. Love wasn't meant for me. My own mother didn't want me. Jackie, she's more of a woman than I'll ever be. They think this box makes me a real woman, but what's the use in being able to hug my curves if I can't be hugged by a child of my own? Something is different this time, John, I can feel it. If something happens to me, happens to us, I just wanna say one more time, happy birthday, Mr. President, Marilyn. Wow, again, the use of the form of a letter, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today, Valerie. Um, and we will move on next to Alexis Roan Fancher. And Alexis has authored five poetry collections, most recently, Junkie Wife from Moon Tide Press. Other collections include The Dead Kid Poems and Erotic, New and Selected. In addition to poetry, Alexis's photographs are featured worldwide, including on the covers of Witness and the Pedestal Magazine. And Alexis is the poetry editor of Cultural Weekly. Thank you so much for joining us. I can't wait to hear the poem. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Sandy. And uh, 
Margot and Susanna for having me here today. Um, but I have to say to Barbara, um, Audrey Hepburn was five foot seven, so not petite, willowy, slender, maybe even a little delicate, but not petite. Anyway, my two cents. Um, I loved Marilyn. I wanted to be like Marilyn. I grew up in Hollywood in LA and um, she just was everything I wanted to be. So um, this is a poem from a different point of view than what I've heard here today. And um, it's one of those poems that really happened. So uh, it's called At 18. When I wanted to be seen, when I danced out to the edge, when I was so afraid to love, when I longed to be a Marilyn, when I slept my way to the top, when I opened my legs, but not my heart, when I shouted at my mother over dinner, when I grow up, I'll be somebody not like you. When I took a lover twice my age, when I told him I wanted photos wearing only my grandmother's ruby necklace, when he shot me butt naked on my mother's oriental rug, when I went home to flaunt the affair, when I fluttered a cache of the photos onto her bed, when she walked to her closet and opened the bottom drawer, when she handed me a large blue envelope, when I looked at photos of my mother, naked, her young face wicked, movie star dreamy, when I recognized the girl who wore only a ruby necklace and looked like she had even bigger plans than mine, when she said, I was only 16 and he was 40. Thank you. Oh, loving these poems. Wow. Thank you so much, Jill. Th thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Alexis. Um, it's wonderful to hear that perspective that you're sharing. And uh, it's interesting to think of Marilyn and also where she kind of where she stands in relation to other sort of iconic actresses of the same of, of the same time period, bringing up Audrey Hepburn and others. Well, our next reader is Julie Danho, who is the author of Those Who Keep Arriving, which won the 2018 Gerald Cable Book Award from Silver Review Press in 2020. Julie's also published her chapbook, Six Portraits, which won the 2013 Slaffering Hall Press chapbook competition. And she's received a McCall Johnson Fellowship as well as fellowships from the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts. Would you please welcome Julie Danho? Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. So um, I wrote this poem. <laughs> Um, many years ago when I saw a work uh, by the sculptor Evie Day and it was called Bombshell and it was a web of fishing line and turnbuckles that was made to look like Marilyn Monroe's dress when um, the subway was blowing it up and so um, so this poem the shape of it is actually meant to look like Evie Day's sculpture so this is called Bombshell. How many men would have fought to free Marilyn from that dress? Someone did and left the dress behind, caught in a floor to ceiling web of fishing line as hourglass as the actress. At first glance, it's lovely. The dress blown up like the subway still runs beneath, like hands still can't resist the gust. But the eye loves to rely on memory so you'll almost miss those holes in the billows, the shreds once tied at the neck, bits of dress flung to the web's far corners. When you find her, fabric fused to arms and hair, you'll say, get down. But she knows where this is going. 
Thank you. Again, everybody, it's a great testament, I think, to the editors, Susanna and Margo, to have selected poems that really reflect um, the, uh, the, the the breadth of forms that you're going to see, uh, not in addition to in addition to the subject matter of the poems. And uh, again, can't wait to see the po the shape poem, <laughs> the shape of that iconic that iconic dress. Thanks for sharing the poem today with us, Julie. Great reading. Well, we're down to just a few more of these star-studded poems. And our next reader is Bill Moore. And Bill is currently professor in the Department of English at California State University, Long Beach, which Long Beach has another iconic uh, emblem in its harbor, the Queen Mary, near and dear to my heart. <laughs> Just wanted, whenever I see Long Beach, I have to mention the Queen Mary, sorry. It's my penchant for ocean liners. Bill Moore also has published Holdouts, the Los Angeles Poetry Renaissance, 1948, from 1992 from the University of Iowa Press. So if you are wanting to learn more about the connection between Los Angeles and its poetry community, please do check out Bill's collection. And his most recent collection of poems is The Headwaters of Nirvana, Los Manan, Tiales de Nirvana, which is a bilingual edition published by What Books. I'm so glad to have you here, Bill, to share your poem thank of you. Marilyn Monroe. Uh, thank you for including me in this reading. There's, there's so many poets here whose work I've admired for uh, decades in some cases. So um, thank you very much. Uh, this, this poem, um, refers to a, a specific movie at the, towards the end, Some Like It Hot, uh, which indeed, um, as has been said, um, is absolutely worth watching again and again. Um, this poem's entitled Labials, letters pronounced by lips, M, P, B. Your name bounces a pair of Ms, a hum of men at movies. Your pictures clip from magazines billow like frothing clouds before a clump of a storm. The wretchedness of beauty is they only notice you and not what your eyes linger on, an amethyst glass knob at the end of a gear shift. Your masseuse fingers your chin. She's seen a thousand figures spray up from behind, legs arching into waist and shoulders, but when they spin around, each face withers faster than chrysanthemums in a tall vase. Your glow promises what any woman adored wants to promise only once. On a hot summer night, a boat's anchored to a bobbing slosh. A reclining man knows which line was meant for Marilyn. I don't feel anything anymore. Isn't that what a woman says when she yearns to be stunned? Love should be perfect, but no one is until the heart you've won is your own. Thank you. Again, I just want to say test, you know, kudos to these editors, Susanna, Margo, just choosing these poems today, uh, which is again emblematic of the many, many more that you also can read. Just the, the quality of the work is is outstanding. I'm truly enjoying. Well down to our last three poems um, of our invited guests before we turn this back over to the editors for some final comments and a poem. 
our next reader uh, is another poet who is, we're very familiar with here at Cultivating Voices Live Poetry, Indran Amar Thanayagam, who published in 2020, three books of poetry in three languages. And I defy many folks to say that they could make that same claim. And those books include The Migrant States, Sir Lil Nostalgic, and Linka al Tiempo. His most recent book that's just been released is Blue Window. And we've been so fortunate to be able to hear from all of these collections here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. And it's a pleasure to get to hear your contribution to I Want to Be Loved by You. And Ron, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you. Um, Susanna and uh, Margot, I mean, a real honor to be included in this book. Um, actually, the very new book of mine, it's called 10,000 Steps Against the Tyrant. Um, and uh, it's a book that I, I recommend to you, <laughs> if I may say. The poem is called Across the Line. The woman slouched off the sheets beatific, voluptuous, full of desire, a dream in absolute, resolute death. I've wanted to sing your name ever since I read Ernesto Cardinal's ode, ever since I rolled off the seat laughing at the seven-year itch, some like it hot. Yes, I agree, and your birthday song to the president of national TV makes later transgressions almost quaint but you chose to hide in public until you were killed. A suicide, theater of the absurd. That last film in Texas with Gable and Clift, all of you to die within a year of the making. I believe you were yanked from stage by an assassin, Marilyn, but who? Us, the mobster Giancana sent. In any case, you're killing the first of the 60s horrors before Malcolm, Martin, John, Bobby, goodbye, yellow brick, Norman, Jean, your birth names, and only 36 years old when you left us for the unknown, wondering about your part in the dream. Yes, the dream of the greater union. Is it possible to dream, Marilyn, now that you are an angel on the other side? Is it okay to cross the dividing line? Thank you. Beautiful, just beautiful. There it is, there it is, anthology. And there's Indran's poem, Contribution. Thank you so much for sharing with us today Thank and you. being gracious as you always are. Our next poet, our second to last of the featured poets is Meredith Treed, whose tenement Threnody is from Main Street Rag. And I have to say, I love saying tenement Threnody. <laughs> Stephen F. Austin State University Press also published her field theory. And she has had numerous residencies at Blue Mountain Center, Ragdale, Salt and Stall, and the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts in Virginia and in France. And it's such a pleasure to be able to hear your contribution to I Want to Be Loved by You, poems about Marilyn Monroe. Thanks for being with us, Meredith. Thank you all for having me here. Um, the poem that I'm going to read is um, based on something I remembered about Marilyn's death that I did not understand until I wrote the poem. So it's one day in the 60s. When dad was awake, the kitchen radio played mostly pop tunes like Make Believe Ballrooms, Sinatra, Mathis, crooners, not rockers, early morning news always. So I cried when I heard it, shapeless, sardonic, sad, a never yet kissed young teen, 
wondering why I wept. Now I know. Once my hero's bride, Marilyn, so alluring, sexy, funny, sweet. If she couldn't bear such a splendid life, how could I hang on to mine? Oh, what a poem. What a poem. Thank you so much, Meredith. What a pleasure to, to hear your contribution to I Want to Be Loved by You. Poems about Marilyn Monroe. Well, the last poem um, of the featured poets before I, as I said, I turn this over to our uh, fabulous editors to close us out for today. Uh, uh, Dare I say, it's one of my own. And uh, I was a little reluctant to share, but Susanna asked me, would you please read? So I'm going to share my contribution. And uh, and uh, I hope it holds up against all of these other poems that I've heard today. Um, I'll just say my connection to Marilyn is through uh, Andy Warhol. Uh, I had studied much about Warhol. Uh, when I was younger and wrote this poem when I was spending some time and hanging out with uh, Lucy Brock Broido, uh, taking a workshop from her. And so this is actually a poem about Warhol in which Marilyn makes a cameo appearance. Uh, and uh, as well as there's another reference to Valerie Solanus, who uh, was another person that hung out at Warhol's factory. And actually, uh, if you're familiar with Warhol's bio, um, had, uh, had shot him. Uh, if, and there's a very famous photograph of, of him and his scars um, that, uh, was was taken by Maplethorpe. So uh, these two women uh, appear in the poem and, and you'll see how they link back to Warhol. I had another poem about Marilyn actually that, um, you know, Warhol had many um, screens of, 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 of her. And I'm sure many of you have seen them. I should have put it as my background today. Um, I had a poem that I actually made in the shape of all the names of those Marilyn portraits that he did. But, um, but this is a poem I chose to contribute to the anthology and it's called Andy, it's called Warhol unveils his last artist statement before his gallbladder bursts. In the future, Everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. You can't choose fame as a celebrity or an artist. One day you just wake up and feel that mob swelling in the pit of your stomach. When I take showers, I don't look for the scars. I know each bullet left a symmetrical pattern of sinister flesh. And that's all I'm concerned with the repetitions of us all. I've left the task of animating the real for the artists like Alice and Richard. I paint things I always thought beautiful, things you use every day and never think about. I've attempted self-portrait suicide, but I couldn't twin the crimson red pooling on the concrete floor with the colors on the canvas. It's just as well. I never screened Valerie or these scars she imprinted onto my flesh. Why give her the golden ticket she craves when there are more photogenic messes like Marilyn and Edie? I blend them into repetitions of themselves to decapitate their flaws. They created their own self-inflicted fame. I don't deserve the credit. I just intervened at the height of their cliffhangings. 
When I long to forget about them, I watch reruns, paint corrugated Brillo boxes, glass Coca-Cola bottles, Campbell's aluminum cans. I used to have the same soup lunch every day for 20 years. And imagine those starlets only as actresses dangling in B commercials. I want to be a machine, famous so simple to mass produce in the factory on 33rd Street. I manufacture the gruesome here, package it all in see-through wrappers and plastic containers of artificial personalities. No one sees how tragic the original is. You see a face glazed over again and again, and it loses everything. It becomes boring. I never give my background. And anyhow, I make it all up, different, every time I'm asked. Thank you. Well, now, let's spend a little more time before we close out today's reading. Uh, again, great thanks to Margot and Susanna. I hope you've enjoyed hearing the poems today as much as I have. And uh, congratulations on the sellout <laughs> of the anthology that we learned today. Uh, please don't hesitate to order. Because exactly. Be keep, keep, keep those orders coming. Keep those orders coming. Thanks for that great poem, Sandy. And um, thank you again for the series. Thanks everyone for reading. Each reading is so unique because there's so many poems in the anthology and different people read. And it's so, so exciting to hear all these new voices every single time. Thank you so much for being here. And I also wanted to thank Susanna. I, had, I just feel that everyone should realize how resourceful and brilliant she is and that this anthology would, would have taken maybe 20 years to put together without Susanna's incredible skills and organizational ability, which I definitely do not um, possess. But And she's a great friend and a great colleague. So thank you so much. Well, and well, I wanted- I admit to being organized, but Margo, if, you, if when I said we should do a Marilyn Monroe anthology, I said it as a joke. And so you really made it real because I would have let it go. <laughs> uh, well, anyway. Well, anyway, um, we thought we would just read our poems since we're here anyway. And um, <clears throat> my poem is in my new book, The End of Horses, which was just published by Broadstone Books. And I wrote it back in the day when I, I used to dye my hair. So just a little context. Beauty parlor. A pedicurist clips a hangnail from a client's big toe, while Monsieur Marc, cultivated Belgian, whittles away at her hair. He praises her Botox, only five injections, her face now full and taut. In 1905, blondine hair was scandalous. Over a century later, I'm trying to make mine as platinum as possible, bleach out, then blend with the gray growing in cut down on visits and cost. While I stamp out signs of age, my stylist, a striking woman who was recently a man, talks about her boyfriend in a soft, masculine voice. On the corner below at Lexon 28th, we observe a woman, blonde hair straggling like Marilyn's on her way down. But this woman's roots have grown in three inches of black. What a shame, exclaims Mr. Mark. The woman stumbles, gropes the trash can, body bent over off balance. Oddly leaning, she careens, wobbles into the street. Bus breaks screech, she hawks green phlegm. Must be on crack, says one client. Monsieur Mark wonders, why doesn't she do something with her hair? Thanks. Thank you. All right, Susanna, you're going to close us out, it sounds like. Okay, okay. I'm going to take it away uh, with my contribution to the anthology. Another poem about a movie or referencing a movie, and this is Atomic Blonde. Hmm. 
A woman labeled a tramp in a tight dress in the first half of any 1953 movie is going to be dead by its second half, like in Niagara, Marilyn playing vampy Rose Loomis, passion kissing her lover behind a barrier to the falls, the water, a symbol of rutting life force, if ever there were one, is later strangled by her husband George in revenge. I had that husband too, who'd already tried to cut off my air at home, a pillow over my face. This wasn't a film and I fought back. Why were we at Niagara on vacation? I'd left the lover in New York City to kiss and mess around with on my return, no intent to coax him into a killing by a waterfall. I wanted only to be pushed out, too indecisive by nature just to leave. But in this marriage, I always had to do the cleaning up. Not a femme fatale. I was more the Polly Cutler type, the one who takes a first aid kit on vacation to soothe all possible injuries. But my George Loomis didn't steal a boat and drop to his end over the falls. When we got home, I got the papers and he signed them. Thank you. Fantastic. Just absolutely fantastic. Just absolutely fantastic. I want to thank, I want to thank, of course, the editors. I, of I Want to Be Loved by You, poems about Marilyn Monroe, Milk and Cake Press, Susanna and Margot for bringing us this amazing cast of poets that we heard today. And also with apologies for the, the trickster energy that began our reading today, but we're poets, we persevered and had an incredible, incredible, incredible reading. And, um, and, and I know people are gonna be wild about when they, when they, when they watch it um, uh, on, the, on the videos. Uh, I'm sure we will, uh, it will be fabulous for folks to watch it. So thank you to all. And let me remind you who we heard from today again. Well, Susanna and Margot also shared with us the poem of Judy Gron. And then to our featured poets, we heard from Sebastian Matthews, Barbara Goldberg, Tina Kane, Sally Blitimus Dunn, Hoyt Rogers, Suzanne Sigafus, Denise Duhamel, Lynn McGee, Liz Marlowe, Marion Brown, Valerie Frost, Alexis Roan Fancher, Julie Danho, Bill Moore, Indran Amirthanayagam, Meredith Treed, and you got to hear one from yours truly, cameo appearance by Marilyn Monroe. Again, my friends, uh, we had we also had uh, we also had the publishers from Milk and Cake Press here who were, were able to share with us that the anthology is doing so very very well. So do keep please do keep your orders in. You'll want it to be part of your collection uh, because it is now such a well sought after anthology. Well, one one other quick thing is that Milk and Cake Press are also donating their proceeds, I and mean, not just Susanna, and not just that Susanna and I are doing that, but they are too. Oh, thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing that very critical detail. And we do want to encourage you all to uh, check out Rain's um, website and contribute. Make your own contribution uh, to supporting this effort to encourage more advocacy and understanding and support for peoples who are enduring and part of a cycle of violence that here we understand as domestic violence. RAIN organization, you will want to read about the good works that they do. Folks, those of you who have been in the audience with us today, one of you will be from a random selection 
receiving a copy of the anthology. So be on the lookout if you are that lucky recipient of the anthology in our giveaway. And, and, we, th and we, thank, um, we thank Susanna and Margo and Milk and Cake Press for donating a copy of I Want to Be Loved by You, poems about Marilyn Monroe. Well, just a few final notes before I close out for today. Um, and to say this, next week, if you've loved today's reading, what was not to love about everyone that you've heard, come back. You'll, you'll be very pleased to see some familiar faces and hear some incredible poetry because it is our new book showcase, our, our first of April of Poetry Month here in the States. You'll be hearing from Susanna Case, The Damage Done, Margot Taft Stevers, and also joining them will be Mervyn Taylor and Andrea Deacon. You will not want to miss this new book showcase, our new book showcase for the month of April. Well, all, you've been here uh, pre Oscars for a star studded event of poetry. Uh, I, uh, I hope you've enjoyed the afternoon, evening as much as I have. I, all, I only wish I'd worn a tuxedo is all I can say. I should have put on a tux. I should have worn my top hat at the very least. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. I look forward to being with you all next week and in inviting back Susanna and Margot. And please, would you unmute and thank all of our readers and Margot and Suzanne for their contributions to Cultivating Voices Live Poetry today. Thank, thank you. Fabulous. Really great. Uh, everybody, I'll just say again, my apologies to the Trickster Energy and thank you to Kim and Kim Ports Parsons and Don Krieger for helping us get everybody assembled into the room, <laughs> getting us assembled into the room. And also it's very, very rare on our program when we have, when, when we have a, when we have a, 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 a troublemaker, uh, you know, a, a, a Zoom, a, a, a Zoom interloper. And my apologies for those interruptions. My apologies for those interruptions. We try to have a tight ship here and normally, uh, normally we do so, but today the April Fools and the tricksters got us and all right. And again, as I said, the poets persevered. We persevered brilliantly. Thank you all. And of course, as I always end each program, I remind you all, please stay safe out there. Take very, very, very good care of your beloveds and keep writing <laughs> those poems in all <laughs> forms, whether they are about the movie stars or about the stars yeah. above. Keep <laughs> writing those poems. Sandy Thanks, Sandy. Sandy. Thank you. 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 Thank you.